Hello everyone and thanks for coming back to the channel. If I sound a bit weird, it's because I am recovering after getting sick, after getting back from vacation. Isn't that wonderful? No more than 10 hours after getting back to the house, wake up, shivers, cold, sick, all sorts of badness. But I, I'm feeling pretty well, but I still sound a bit funny, so we'll just have to kind of bear with me there a little bit. Before we get into the Q&A, I have two things I need to do a bit of house cleaning. One I really don't want to do, but I feel kind of compelled to. But the first one is, I have over the last few months gotten a few questions about my wedding ring. I haven't been wearing it. Um, I don't know if you can tell, but this part of my finger, I must have injured it. Because it's way more swollen than this one. And my ring got really tight, and so I pulled it off. After a few weeks, I tried it back on. I wore it for a couple of hours, and it started getting real sore again. So um, I don't know what I've done here, but maybe I might just have to get a new ring or something because that doesn't seem to be going down, and it's been several months now. Um, I still got a chunky... Look at how fat that is right there. <laughs> You got a fat little finger down there. But anywho, no, uh, my wife and I are still together. Everything's just fine. Just got a weird little fat finger injury thing. The second thing that I don't want to cover is a little bit of drama. So if you want to skip that, I completely feel you. And I'll have a table of contents down to the Q&A questions down below. So you can click those and jump to the timeline. Okay, for this part that I don't want to cover, it's, it's YouTube drama. So I've never wanted to be a part of this, but in this particular case, another small video creator decided to make a video, and a few of you saw it and sent it to me, and then after some discussion, I decided to watch it myself. They call me out in a couple of different ways, and I don't appreciate it, and I think it can't be left unchecked, uh, because they don't use any context or factual data to support it. It's just specula speculation and accusation on my um, uh, to towards me, uh, and I'm not one to let those things go. I've spent a lot of time building my online reputation, and I think I deal with people online the same way I deal with people in real life. So I don't appreciate this sort of thing going on. Uh, let's talk about the video in question. I do have it linked down below. Uh, the video creator decided not to uh, link anything in their video. Uh, just, you know, their wild speculation about me and the uh, veracity of the videos that I make or the authenticity of the videos I make. Um, so there is, is linked down below and I am using a URL tracker so that I know how many views they have us to think is for. Uh, the title of the video is Mobula 7 Happy Model, We Are Not Happy Drone Economics. And about halfway through the video, they're talking about uh, how they're not happy with Happy Model. Fine. And then about halfway through with a large inflection in their voice, they say Nick Burns comes to, or he says, Nick Burns comes to defend the Mobula 7. And that's not true. I never said in this thread on Facebook, which is also linked down below, the word Mobula. Didn't say it. So that's just not factual in my opinion. Then they make you accusation or insinuation that I am somehow on the Happy Model payroll, which is also not true. Just an accusation, blind accusation. So I think it was a very poor choice, and um, in my case, I think it shows a lot more about the individual as well. And lastly, later on in the video, there seems to be a moment where they choose to try to pile on or build their case that somehow my videos are not valid or authentic or somehow tainted in that stating that I had said in one of the 1S brushless whoop videos that it turtle moded just fine and it, it doesn't. Um, they say in their video they're going to find that video and link it, but they don't do that. So, again, wild speculation with no factual or data. Whether I actually did make a mistake in a video, I'm fine with that because I've always said I make mistakes and I do my best to correct them. They seem to be using this as a possibility of creating doubt. Now the smart money would be to not deal with this at all. I know. A lot of you are going to tell me, why are you going down this route? Because I do feel like this is a bit of a personal attack. I think it was offsides. I think it was a poor choice and I don't appreciate it. Um, and I can't let it go unchecked, especially based upon the fact that they didn't include any context for anyone who's seen it. And they've posted this to two different groups, the 2S Power Whip group and to the Mobula 6 7 group. And so they're trying to promote this video and they're promoting this video with negativity about me in it. So I feel strongly that I have to make sure that people who see that video have the opportunity to get more context to what's going on. And instead of just believing these blind ac accusations, they get some background, some data, some facts about 
what what was going on. Onto the Facebook portion of this. So there is oftentimes a lot of people posting on Facebook about broken frames for the Bogula 7. You know, mine broke for it too. Recommended uh, welder to repair it. And so when I see these posts, especially as the V2 frame came out, um, I would look for data about the crash. You know, how high it was. Was there a fail safe? Did it roll off the house? How cold it was? Things of that nature, because plastics aren't going to hold up as well in cold. And most of the Northern Hemisphere is in winter. So if we're flying this outside and we crash it and it's 40 degrees, yeah, maybe we should expect it to break. Um, this particular case, uh, someone had a V2 frame and they said that it broke just as easily as the V1 frame. So they're switching to the Beta 75 frame. So I'm scrolling through and I'm looking for any crash details to see if anybody else had asked or the original poster had submitted that information lower down in the, the Facebook posting. And I came across the post where this individual says, it's a garbage frame, they shipped with this product, they made a better one, but guess what all early adopters are left in the cold? Good thing is new. the newer frame is only 4 to $5, but they aren't shipping them free uh, to the initial buyers, thumbs down, happy model, stay away, IMO. Hmm, stay away, okay. Um, so there, there's other people commenting that I'm not including either their comment, and you can go to the Facebook group and look at it, uh, but I don't want to try to implicate anyone else other than myself and this other party who decided to make a video calling me out. Uh, so this individual, you know, I still haven't responded or anything. Uh, they're responding to someone else that I've got blacked out there on screen. It says, I've flown about 30 Whoop class since the early Isheen QX series days. This is not by any stretch one of the best Whoops ever made. It's just the latest hot thing. So was the Snapper 7 two months ago. Does anyone care about the Snapper 7 now? No, because it was a bad product that flew well. Bad QC, bad components. The Mobula 7, unfortunately, is the same. It does fly well, but it's an assemblage of inferior components. Pretty strong claims. So I decided to ask, if you're comparing best or not best, what are you comparing it to? Pretty straightforward. I'm asking a question. I haven't yet to say the word Mobula or 7 in any capacity, as they claim I came defending. So then the next post I have to break up so you can see it on screen a little bit. And they're responding directly to me. says, uh, IMO. The best Whoop class product to hit the market in the last three years is the Emacs Tiny Hawk. Now remember, I asked if you're comparing best or not best, what are you comparing it to? They respond, Emacs Tiny Hawk. So many innovations and a single well-polished product that costs the same as the Mobula. Virtually any full-speed product will have a better finished product feel than these happy models as well. Back when brush ruled the landscape, you had equally problematic quads in the qu quill. Uh, the QX95, QX70C, QX90C, etc. all flew pretty well, but they had those all-in-one camera VTX antenna designs that would break if you landed upside down. But the brush setups were actually pretty reliable and solid. Uh, then they go on, they talk about the, the Leader 120 a little bit. You can read all this uh, in detail if you'd like, uh, either pausing on the screen or going uh, to the Facebook post. Uh, but you see there in the, uh, what's it, the third to last paragraph, the very next offering from Happy Model, a two escapable quad using recycled parts from various categories actually flew better than expected, despite having a less than stellar camera. Its performance was quite good, but the frame it shipped with was what was a known defect. So when I saw that known defect, I thought, how do you know? Did you have some role in Happy Model's business model and this coming to light? I don't think so. Oddly, they announced a V2 frame the day before many of the pre-orders shipped, leading to nearly every person to receive one getting the inferior V1 frame. I don't think this is correct by any stretch, and I don't think they know. I think, again, they're making an emotional claim with any uh, factual data. I could tell you from personal experience, having close contact with Happy Model, I had that model a month before pretty much anyone else did. And I had reported to the frame breakages, they did acknowledge it. It's not the first time a frame has been known to break. We get a lot of frames that break. The product comes to market. It starts shipping from Banggood and um, Race Day Quads and um, some of the other U.S. or North American-based shops are importing this at, at, as fast and feverishly as they could. Stu's got his videos, which uh, apparently got all sorts of great attention, and it just became a very hot product. 
And if you remember, they had posted, and you can look this up to, to verify the timeline yourselves, they posted that video where they throw the frame at the floor, and then very late in the video, uh, they have an assembled V2 frame, and they fly it into the wall, and it doesn't break. So you can look at the published date on that video on their YouTube channel, and then compare that to when people were receiving it to verify the, the timeline yourself. Uh, so I think that is incorrect and, and quite misleading. This means that Happy Model knew there was an issue with the frame they had a, on hand. Okay, and started working on a V2 frame to solve the issue. Okay, well, I don't really see this problem still yet. However, rather than waiting to ship initial shipments to replace the defective frames, they shipped them anyway. This type of anti-consumer practices in FPV needs to be scrutinized carefully as we have no, um, we have no seen back to back, we have now, I think it's supposed to be, we have now seen back to back offerings by the same company, Happy Model, where they are cutting corners in attempts to reach market and uh, end up shipping substandard product. This is now an established trend rather than a single isolated incident. And their attempts to rectify the situation are simply to have you per purchase more items to replace the defective item you were shipped. No Happy Model, not today. I thought that was awful strong and kind of unreasonable. What happened to those t-shirts that we used to have that said, build, fly, crash, repair, repeat? Aren't we supposed to expect to repair these quads from time to time? I do. Otherwise, I'm just not having fun. So I respond to this person. I say, to play a bit of a counterpoint, you don't take issue with the tiny hawk's inability to flip over after a crash or the cameras popping out or the camera popping out or the motor connectors coming loose or the tiny struts breaking. Can't we apply the anti-consumer argument to the Tiny Hawk and its props flip over? A short time after initial release, we saw another prop that can turtle flip over the Tiny Hawk. By the same analogy, Emacs must have known of this issue and brought the Tiny Hawk to market and continued to sell it while working on a new prop to correct the issue. My greater point is the entirety of the FPV market has yet to find a perfect quad. Thus, thus each individual has to determine what is the quad's most important features or characteristics and which are we are willing to sacrifice. So that's the extent of my comment. And you've seen my comments on this thread. At no time did I say Mobila or Mobila 7 or Happy Model. And actually what I did was I took his point and turned it on the product that he was supporting and, and showing I was trying to enlighten or inform that, you know, you could very easily twist that same sort of thought process back to Emacs. Um, and you could probably do that to most products because there isn't a flawless product that comes to market. It's just this way this hobby is. We're always looking for something better. That is what we're doing. We're always looking for something better, something that helps us have more fun or become a better pilot or is just better in some way. So later on in the th thread, it says, I really don't think Tiny Hawk is an apples to apples comparison. I just mentioned it because someone asked for an example of a good product. That's not what happened. I did not ask for an example of a good product. I asked if you're comparing or com not comparing what is best or not best, what are you comparing it to? Their comparison was the Tiny Hawk. Not trying to troll or anything, guys, just inform. I'll take the conversation to YouTube. This will make a good drone ec drone economics segment. So there we have the title of the video in this thread. Uh, there is a, a number of other people that are basically not agreeing with this individual and how they're thinking or what their opinion on the topic is. And, and I've left those out just because that's uh, that's not my news to share. I'm just sharing what I've uh, shared with you, which is my part and these, uh, the video creator who decided to call me out part. So I think it was truly poor form to take that discussion, which I thought we were having a discussion and turning it into accusations and insinuations that somehow the, uh, videos that I've created are not valid or are less than honest. And I, I don't appreciate it. And I, I think this is the sort of behavior precisely that creates a negativity within our hobby that we don't need. There, there's no point to it. There's nothing good that can come up this. Um, and, and their last statement that I'll take the conversation to YouTube. This will make a good drone economics segment. That sounds like a little boy who grabbed his football and said, and I'm going home too. Didn't want to have the conversation anymore because it wasn't going in the direction they wanted. If you're, if you're going to have strong opinions about something, you should be prepared in, like anything, say debate or life, you or work, you have to choose to defend them. And you have to use language to defend them. If you're going to defend them by just saying, oh, you're all wrong and I'm out of here, that doesn't hold much weight. And it doesn't work in the real world either. 
So I don't appreciate them calling me out in the three different ways and trying to make somehow the efforts that I have tried to give this um, hobby um, less than anything other than what's all that I can be. I, I don't appreciate that. Um, I'm not asking anyone to take up this charge for me. I'm not asking you to go and thumbs down the video or leave negative comments or if you see this person online to flame them out. That's not my point at all and I think that'll actually just propagate more negativity. So I'd encourage you not to do that. But what I want this video to be is something that if you have seen that video and maybe you didn't understand or you just trusted this other person that maybe there's another side of the story. And then in the future, if you see something that's maybe even outside of FPV space, it might help you understand that that is one person's perception and that there is also another side or possibly multiple sides to things. Uh, oftentimes the cliche perception is reality gets thrown around quite a bit and it is true perception is reality but if someone's perception isn't based in reality then that is not a valid cliche okay on to more fun things so we've got a comment here and we're going to start answering these q a questions simte true shit true chete i'm going to butcher a lot of names i'm I sure i apologize i wish i was a better linguist and i could get these right but um you can see the comments uh there on screen uh what does your family and especially your wife think about the hobby when you're flying around the house once again <laughs> and then kind of the, the winky smiley face my youngest gets annoyed when she's got a show on and i'm flying kind of around in front of her and i kind of do that kind of you know being an annoying dad i'll fly around in front of her and then i'll zoom off and i'll stay away and i'll, I'll come back by and i can hear her yell out you know dad because she's having a hard time hearing the tv other times she gets up and runs after me the other two kids do nothing and my wife doesn't care at all um i've told a story once before at thanksgiving uh we had a gathering here at the house and uh, it had kind of you know post meal gone to a little bit of a lull the cleanup was pretty much done and so i grabbed one of the little quads and was flying it around and uh, my mother-in-law and father-in-law <laughs> didn't seem to care for it and said something to my wife ab ab about you know me flying around the house and uh, she said something to them I, I couldn't quite hear everything I was sitting in the next room but she said don't worry about it he's really good at that and I just kind of had to laugh I had to laugh for two reasons was my in-laws are in my house complaining about something I'm doing and then my wife has to tell them don't worry about it <laughs> okay uh, Matthew Saigon, do you, did you fly drones while you were on your cruise? He's talking about the vacation. No, I did not. It was a Disney cruise, and Disney is very anti-drone. They have signs um, all over the place and in the fine print on their brochures and things of that nature that let you know drones are not permitted. I sure didn't want to have anything confiscated either. Shane Doherty, hope your holiday was great. Thank you very much. What is your regular job? I am an IT manager for a financial institution. Uh, have your neighbors ever gotten upset about the noise of your quads buzzing around? Thanks, my friend. Uh, no, my, main, my neighbors haven't gotten upset. Um, I actually landed a quad in my neighbor's pool one time, and he dove in and got it for me. <laughs> it was at lunchtime, and he's retired. And uh, I had an ESC freak out. And the last thing I saw was blue, and I knew it was in the pool. But it was so small, and apparently in the bottom of the pool, we couldn't see it. And so he's like, well, I'll go in. I got my swimsuit on, and he dove right in. Uh, I took him a bottle of wine like a week later to thank him for it. And um, that's that's been like the only real interaction. No, that's not true. A couple years ago, I caught a tree limb or something like that with, I can't remember which quad, and it, and it came crashing down, you know, on a flat spin on my neighbor's deck. And when it smacked their deck, they were probably having dinner or something of that nature. And they they did come out as I was marching over there to try to find it. And they're like, what was that? And I showed them and they just kind of laughed and went back inside. You know, they all know I fly. We've talked about it. Uh, we do have a new neighbor across the street. And when we introduced, uh, we somehow got on the topic of the, the noise. And I told him what I'm doing. And he thought it was super cool. He's actually... Um, a chimney sweep and so he uses a you know aerial photography drone in order to look down in the chimney um and he had i when i asked him about you know some of the licensing and things of that nature he had no idea he he's just you know just a guy who went out and bought what he needed to run his business and he's doing it fred bowen 
Do you or have you participated in races? With your skills, I'm sure you'd be a top contender, and lots of them have cash prizes that could help you with the out-of-pocket money cost it to uh, cost you to keep up with all the new stuff. Uh, no, Fred, I have not raced. I'm, I've actually never been to a quad race of any sort. Um, they do have quad races about an hour away sometimes, um, but with the kids' schedule and my wife's schedule, just life schedule, you know, racing, from what I can tell, I follow Paul Nurkula, uh, Nurk FPV online, and it, it really takes, it, it's like racing, like if you do motorcycle racing or car racing, it's an all weekend or all day event, and I just don't have all day to dedicate for something like that. Um, I would... I would feel guilty if I were to take a, a, an entire weekend day on a regular basis away from my family to go race. I think it would be fun to try one sometime uh, when that opportunity is you know, readily available and, and leaves me guilt-free, uh, but at this point, I have not. Rory O'Connell, great stuff, Nick. Is there any real difference between the Amway and Fat Shark goggles besides personal preference? I live on an island, and everything has to be shipped. There's no shop I can walk into to get drone parts or from or just uh, try something understand the module selection is a big pro for fat sharks but are amway stock diversity receivers really any worse i would say at this time there there is a big difference now that we have rapid fire and lrc we have some kind of newer way of thinking about rf and how we receive it and and use it in the goggles that having a goggle with enclosed receivers that you, you at the very least you would really have to hack up in order to replace the modules to get that advanced um, or new technology in receiving the FPV signal yeah there's going to be a difference now if you're just comparing it to other goggles that aren't using some of the newer receivers there's not that much of a difference you will feel it a little bit the, the fat shark materials do feel in my opinion a bit more premium especially the hdo's versus the amways the amways feel a little bit more budget or friendly or a little bit econ more economical uh, the foam on them doesn't feel quite as nice on the face um, it has that the strap for the overhead which i took off of mine and um, I think there was, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, everyone, but doesn't the Amway Commanders, didn't it default to widescreen? Uh, and then you had to switch it to 4.3 and there wasn't a way to make it switch permanently to 4.3. I might have that wrong. I don't have the Commanders anymore. I gave those away in a giveaway probably six plus months ago. Uh, so there is a little bit of a difference in, in some of those areas, but it's not huge. Um, I think it's bigger when you compare to the HDOs and maybe additionally if you're comparing it to use some of the newer receivers on the market that are very very expensive as well it really comes down to a, a budget issue you know you've got the Amway commanders that I think you can get those around 250 and you, you could probably get into a pair of fat sharks close to that but they're going to be used and they're probably not going to have a real good module but the uh, the real ACEC uh, 5808 um, Pro with Achilles on it. That's that's a really good module too. I know there are a lot of people out there very very happy with that, and that was like forty five bucks or something like that. So um, you kind of have to weigh where you want to spend your money. Uh, Mitchell Nelson asks, "What is the best sub two hundred and fifty gram quad you have flown?" And I say the answer to that is this one. And you see, I've got Dill Dillagaff FPV, um, and he mentions the HGLRC H, H, uh, the XJB. That is also very very good. Um, I just like this one a little bit better. I think it's kind of a, a, a later iteration of it. They're both Stretch X frames. Uh, this one has a taller stack, and I think this one was is going to be easier to work on if you needed to work on it. The XJB, in order to get it off, it had kind of a multi-piece with it. it. had the round carbon fiber pieces that went vertically, and then you had some other pieces you had to clip in there. It just got a little bit cumbersome to work inside of that, and I think this one performs very, very well. Um, as far as just pure thrust and performance, this one will outperform it. Uh, you may find that the XJB might be a slightly more agile because I do think that it's a few grams I think it's less than 15 grams difference between the two uh, but this one Stu on UAV futures he uh, clocked this at I think 110 or 150 miles an hour with Jim fan props uh, comes with 32-bit ESC you can get you know more of a standard sized um, antenna on there if you want to um, but it's also got replaceable arms so that might be a bonus as well but this is this is one 
that I would say you need to put in that category is the best uh, sub 250 gram that I've flown. Guillermo, hey Nick, first thanks for your hard work. You remind me of a guy that used to make RC helicopter reviews on a forum. His name was Finless Bob. I've heard that name before. And he used to have the most comprehensive uh, reviews and tutorials. He's still around, but don't fly very often. Uh, to the question now, I was one of the lucky uh, that won one of your giveaways. Thanks again for that. And one thing that are really nice uh, beside to get the price was to get the Hummingbird from the uh, GEP RC that I saw you fly in your video. For me, that is a great thing because I get to firsthand, uh, or excuse me, because I get firsthand to get the experience to feel how a quad flies. You must fly really fast because the tilt on the camera was on the max for that frame. And I was thinking that in this market of ready to fly drones, do you think a repository of dumps of CLIs uh, is of any use? I also use a CLA dump from Albert Kim and also from Andy RC. And a second one, do you fly anything else besides drones? Um, he asks, uh, if, uh, if is so, I would like to see you fly RC helicopter or plane. Um, I, uh, many, many years ago, I did dabble for probably less than 10 months in helicopters. Um, just real cheap budget stuff. I think we were, you know, it, it could be as much as almost 15 years ago now. I think we were just getting started with our family and I was a, one of those spurts where I was looking for a different hobby, something to do besides just work, uh, because I am a bit of a homebody. Um, I, I did also have a flying wing. I think you would call them now at the time we called them a flying Delta. Um, again, I spent very little time flying that because it, it just didn't fit my life. I needed to get out in big fields, you know, flying a, a Plane, you need more space and uh, getting away from home isn't something I'm very good at uh, as far as the uh, CLAs I think that could be useful um, I'm, 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 I'm hedging a bit there because I'm wondering what the purpose is of just having those so that if people are mucking up their settings in beta flight that they have somewhere to turn to restore it but shouldn't they be making their own backups? I, I, I think it could be useful, yes, is the short answer. I just don't know how useful it could be and how many people would be interested in using that. I just don't know. NH Mountain Guy. Uh, good day, Nick. Uh, first, thanks for all the great information you provided. For a second is my sort of question, sort of request. I've been flying for a while, but I'm not a young guy. And I know I'm never going to be a great pilot, but that's not true. You don't know that. You could be a great pilot. You just need to uh, keep practicing and having fun. It seems as if everyone is obsessed with speed and agility um, in out in a new crop of the tiny quads. But honestly, I would rather have durability and long flight time. Sure, everybody wants something different. I still crash a lot, always will. And I spend way too much time repairing when I would rather be flying uh, I fly mostly indoors, tight spaces during the winter and in heavily wooded areas during the summer. So speed is almost liability, especially given the lack of durability in many of these small whoops. I would like to build a whoop specifically designed for maximum durability and the longest flight times possible. Uh, I love the whoops and, and seldom fly my bigger quads anymore. So how about it? Got any ideas for maximizing both durability flight times in a 65 millimeter or 75 millimeter brushless whoop, 1S or 2S. Yeah, that's pretty tough. Um, Cause you know, we, we had the King Kong uh, GT7 and they of course have the GT8 and the flight times weren't real long on those. I do think that frame would be very, very robust. Um, and just by nature, because of the weight, it wasn't necessarily a speedy machine, so the speed would be kept down. They did a few things that some people really won't like with that machine, with the, the smart OSD, which really was a gigantic step back or away from the Betaflight OSD. Other than that, you know, we, we used to build these carbon fiber type pizza box looking quads that would be very durable, but again, the flight times would be short because you're lifting all that extra weight. It's just something, when you get something extra durable, it generally means it's heavier and that weight reduces your flight time. Of course, you can continue to throw more a million per hour batteries at it, you know, bigger and bigger batteries, and you'll get to a point where that flight time will be maximized and then the next size battery up, it'll start to decrease. Um, I don't have a really good idea for something like that. I, I do think the beta FPV frames are very, very durable. Uh, there's the, the, the hoverbot, um, 
the Hoverbot Nano. I had one of those. You can find those at Hoverbot.io. Um, there, there's a couple of, I, I forget the names now. There's two different iterations. Um, I was actually going to buy the new iteration, but my, my order didn't go through when I reached out to them. They refunded me. So, um, and that one has like a carbon fiber. Um, instead of having like a, a, a traditional whoop like this, it had more like a piece of carbon fiber that went around and then it had these struts that come off each motor uh, arm and would support that carbon fiber. So in your FPV view, you would have uh, that carbon fiber bar. Those were pretty light and so you could get some pretty good flight times with those and still be pretty durable. But because of the interlocking pieces, sometimes when you crash, they would kind of pull apart or snap apart. Of course, you can use some some glue or CA to make sure that doesn't happen, but then that might decrease your durability in those crashes. Oh, by the way, many of you are asking about the trash can. Yeah, I will be reviewing that. Unfortunately, NH Mountain Guy, I don't have a really good solution. Um, I think if you're looking for something right now, I would look at probably the GT8, but if you want to stay in that 75 millimeter or 65 millimeter, the flight times just aren't going to be that long as you increase durability. Um, I think on the GT7, though, the flight times were around three minutes uh, indoors and probably about two and a half outdoors, uh, but I was using the stock battery in that case. Hey, Nick, love your channel, mate. I'm somewhat disabled, so my following is basically down to micros in the backyard, making your channel hugely relevant and entertaining. Thank you so much. My question is this. There haven't been many two and a half inch uh, with 4S 4500 KV or thereabout motors. Uh, from what I know, maybe just the Skystars X120 I've been making. Uh, these and they're great. I turned my Leader 3 into a 2.5 inch. So do you still think these are better and more appropriate and fun? Uh, target for motor size KV combination and micros. I found them to be excellent. Um, and you said at one point this is where we should be going, but I haven't seen many. Um, would you consider making your own consumer quad and what would your specs be? I probably wouldn't consider making my own quad just because the time commitment that would take. I think that would really stop me from being able to make reviews and other sorts of videos over a course of a, a longer period of time. Or it would just mean that I have to spend more time squeezing either the consumer quad in, uh, the, the specking out and the building and the, the testing and those things between all the other reviews. And, and I enjoy doing the reviews, so I'd like to stick to that. I'm not worried about having my name on anything or out there in any way, shape, or form. So I probably wouldn't be into that. If somebody, you know, was looking for some sort of... Um, ideas or something i would i would lend them my thoughts free of charge and they could do with it whatever they want um but as far as the motor question and uh 4s and 4500 kv i think you're talking about the 1106 uh stator size yeah i do as far as just flat out performance i think that is where we're looking but unfortunately not all motors unfortunately motor kv has kind of come down to something similar to the C rating on batteries. It's not true all the time. And so that makes it very difficult to judge motors. You know, we tend to, to look at these numbers and the numbers give us a, a measurable figure and we want to use that measurable figure from one motor to another. But unfortunately, 4,500 kV on one motor may be actually 4,400 kV and it might be 40, uh, closer to 5,000 kV on another motor, even though they both say 4,500 kV. And then you have these performance differences and you can pot potentially, even when you're running 4S, you can also have other issues with burning up motors if they're running too too hot or they're just not capable of running for us um, hard you know we spent part of our summer talking about hot motors at least that was a really hot question um, that comes up in the summertime is my motors are smoking hot there's a there's a certain limit to how much heat can be dissipated out of a motor of that size and i i think at some point we either have to just run it just fly it and see what happens and bite the bullet or we're gonna have to trust the manufacturers that they've spec these things out and they can run for us like they say you know we had some issues with the uh, full speed um, motors and they had a couple of iterations because they were burning out on three inch props and for us i don't think running a three inch prop on most 1100 series motors is going to be all that much fun there are a few motors in the 1108 category that can run a, a three inch prop pretty effectively um, but not a lot 
Um, so I think when you're looking at 1105, 1106, and most of the 1107s, a 3-inch prop is going to be too much. 2.5-inch prop is going to be the sweet spot. We're probably looking somewhere around 4,500 kV to maximize the performance. Uh, of course, with performance, we have other factors in there as well. But I do think that's what we're going to see more of. We didn't see a lot of that, oddly enough. Um, so I'm hopeful that as it warms up, we'll start to see more, more models with that sort of motor on it. Big drone flyer. First, I want to say Merry Christmas to you and your family. My question, and I know you get this all the time. I want to get my first brushless whoop that will handle outside. I only have a, a Flysky i6 controller. What should I get? I'm bored with the tiny six. Thanks, bro. Um, for outside, you know, when we, when you, when I when I get questions about which one should I get, it, it's hard for me because again I don't know where you place the emphasis of what you're looking for from a quad. Is it performance? Is it durability? Is it long flight times? Is it you know uh, some other factor I'm not thinking of that's that's going to be really your top priority in a quad? My gut reaction to your question, Big Drone Flyer 77, is likely the trash can. It does fly very, very well. It's got this new frame. It, in my experience, is very robust. Uh, the one drawback to it is the props fly off and that's fixable. Um, it seems as though the different sort of plastics they use to get kind of a transparent prop doesn't necessarily uh, maintain its original shape and therefore the pressure on the motor stem and so eventually they do pop off. Um, I, this does not fly in my opinion, as well as many others inside, but outside it does fly quite well. It's got a camera that's going to handle things a little bit better, the 200 milliwatt uh, VTX. Um, I, I think this would be a good candidate, and you can, of course, buy these in a whole host of different uh, radio protocols um, that are built into the board. Uh, Flysky is a, a, a relatively well-used uh, radio protocol, so you should be able to find something uh, this or or something else. The the Beta FPV products, the new ones that came out, the Pro series, uh, which I'm working on a review. You can see mine's all cracked up. That's the one thing about these is that when it comes to the durability, the frames are very flexible. So when in flight, if you're real aggressive, you'll notice the flex in the frame when you fly. Um, but the, the canopies that they've been using for years, they, they just break really easy. Uh, you could get a 3D printed canopy, but then you're starting to add weight and then it changes the flight characteristics. With the single board stack of this uh, Pro Series, it does fly much better because they brought the weight way down. This flies very comparatively to the uh, the Mobulus 7, um, but the camera on this one has a smaller field of view. That's something that was a little bit hard for me to overcome. Um, so this is another candidate, but I just don't think it would be as perfect for you. Um, the problem with the trash can is they've used bigger motors in here and so their flight times are a little bit shorter But you can get some props from TBS and three bladed props You lose a little bit of the grip and turns and you gain a little bit of efficiency Of course when you drop blades off of your props you do gain some efficiency So it's something to think about I can't necessarily answer your question for certain um, the way it's positioned, but that should help a little bit. Andre M asks, I'm not a big whoop guy. I prefer micros and five inch quads, but I see the need for whoops as well. I have several of them. Do you mind, uh, uh, several of them, mind you, including the Snapper 7, QX65, and Custom 1S brushless whoops. My question is, do you think the full speed tiny leader can be tuned to eliminate the washout? I'm considering the following, Mobula 7, Ishin Trash Can Tiny Leader, or possibly any other 2-3S to three S whoop that comes out in the next few months. I have the Leader 120 and Happy Model stuff already, and I also have the Ishin quads. They're all good, and all have their faults. That's very true with most quads, isn't it? <laughs> is there one that stands out to you? Mmm. You know, this this might be going against the grain a little bit, but this one. Or, depending upon your flight skills and how you want to fly, a V2 Mobula 7. This is a Mobula 7 with a V3, V3 frame. It's also got the F4 flight controller from Happy Model inside of it. And, of course, I use an XT60 pigtail. I even put their little LED on the back. Uh, this frame is very, very durable. The, I find this canopy is very, very durable. I like the canopy design because of the adjustable camera. I like the wide field of view on the camera that's by default. So, you know, comparatively to this... This has a different field of view and a different camera, and some people prefer this uh, quite heavily. I actually don't prefer this camera for indoor flying. It works much better for outdoor flying. Um, 
but because the frame durability for this one is so high um, and but it does increase your weight a bit uh, i have been flying this around the house and i haven't had any breakages but of course you know time will tell on that and i am still flying with two 1s batteries I, I would say if you want to build a custom one, I wouldn't use these new trash can motors. I think they've gone too big. I think 803 is too much, and it just drains your battery. You can't hardly feel the difference in the stick unless you're talking about the very low end of the throttle. There's a big lump of thrust at the lower end of the throttle that actually makes the trash can difficult to fly inside. And so I would stick to getting the 802 motors like we have here on um, the... The, well, this uh, modified trash can, a Mobi the 7 trash can, whatever you want to call this. Um, and I think these frames are going to be coming available soon. Uh, you can get F4 flight controller boards from Happy Model. You can get the Beta FPV F4 flight controller uh, boards. It will mount up just fine. Uh, and then you can just, you can buy these canopies uh, from various places and you can put your favorite camera in there. If you if this camera is kind of a deal breaker for you, then you're looking at going back to something like this. Or you're looking at getting something that's even larger. Um like the the ET series. I don't think we're going to see much viability in 3S whoops. That's that's just my opinion. I reserve the right to be wrong, of course, but I think unless you consider whoops larger than say 85 millimeters still whoops, we just don't have the proper the thrust thrust to carry around that extra cell of a battery. So our flight times are going to be very very short. The Tiner Leader uh, could do 3s but i saw it as kind of a just kind of a niche or cool thing to do not necessarily really that viable because you're carrying around a battery that you know you've you've added another 14 grams to your battery on a quad that uh, weighs 40 grams so that's pretty substantial that one extra cell and it didn't yield a longer flight time i think my flight time when i flew that th when i flew that 3s 300 milliamp battery fairly aggressively on the tiny leader the stock one not the hd one my flight times are still less than two minutes so i'm skeptical on what we'll see on a 3s whoop but maybe somebody can uh find a a, a component mix that, that just hits it out of the park we'll see but i don't think so is that an i or an lv you see yourself on screen there. Do you think if I were looking to start a channel that I could do all my footage with a GoPro, do you think the quality would be bad for build reviews, etc.? I'm looking to get one for flight footage, of course, but I've noticed in this hobby and the end result being starting a channel, when I buy one thing, it's like now I just need this and it keeps going. Do you think I'll need another camera for the bench? Uh, well, if you've got a smartphone, just use that. Um, I Actually, what I'm recording with right now is a... Uh, what a four-year-old Samsung smartphone and I've got a gooseneck attached to my desk that's probably $12 and this mat was probably 20 bucks from Amazon so that's my basic recording setup I use a cell phone you can use a GoPro it gives you kind of a weird perspective because of that ultra wide view and then you've got to have a larger workspace in order to keep it clean or messy depending upon how you choose to film you can definitely do anything you want to to get started I think the main thing is if you really want to do a channel that you should get started but I wouldn't suggest making a really large investment in getting started uh, because you may find that it's not something that you have time for or that you enjoy so I would get started very conservatively fat pastor <laughs> am I saying that wrong Pafat, pahat, faster. <laughs> uh, love your channel. One of my top top four. Come on, man. Uh, just wondering if you would consider selling some of your quads on RC Groups to help fund your channel. I think there are lots of people who can't or don't have the time to build quads. They just want something that will fly. I also think there's a need for, like, the, the working man's review. Something like, okay, guys, here's one simple out-of-the-box flyer or walkthrough to get some airborne. Um... I think I understand. As far as selling, I do not like to sell the stuff that I fly because I don't I don't do one day reviews where I go out and I fly five or six packs and there's no crashes and then I stitch together a, a, a review video. That's not what I do. I fly things over a period of time. It's usually over the course of about a week that I'll get a series of flights somewhere between 25 to 50, maybe even more flights, um, depending upon what the machine is and what my weather's like and how I'm flying, uh, and I crash. And I would, I would feel really bad, even if, if I had, say I had a, a micro that was a $150 micro, and I sold it to somebody for 50 bucks, and, and I thought I had crashed that relatively modestly, and then they get it, and then they go to bind it up, and on their first flight, they plug in a battery, and <laughs> magic smoke, or a motor doesn't work, or something, even though when it left here, it was fine, they didn't get any use out of it, that would, 
that that would be tough for me to to rationalize in my own mind that it's not just the risk versus reward but it would make me feel bad that somebody had given up their money and it ultimately didn't get a product that works from me and that would that would be tough for me to swallow so uh, i tend to give things away and i just ask for that shipping be paid for so that that's how i pay back uh, as far as a workings man's review um, I don't do a lot of the walkthroughs for the setup much anymore. Uh, you can dig back to the channel and you can find some of that stuff. Um, I have thought about going back and revisiting because it has been some time as far as beta flight setup. Um, I get a lot of questions about binding, but there are so many different combinations of binding. Even if I put together a video, I couldn't point someone to just that video for help on binding because uh, it's one of the big things that you see is people have troubles with binding or they think they have it bound or they do have it bound, but they don't have any movement in beta flight when they move the sticks. Um, so it's kind of those one-off setup problems that get to be a little bit cumbersome to try to cover in a video format. So I, I don't think I would do that, but I might do a walk through on how I set up quads. Rick and Jax, Merry Christmas. Nick, thank you very much. I appreciate all your hard work putting these videos out week after week. It must be hard, especially with young kids. Mine are out, employed, married, and time is still precious. My question is, are you always flying the newest quads, or do you also have older favorites that still get airtime? And if so, what are they? Well, I do, uh, Rick. I do go out and I fly older stuff. Like, um, let's see. Well, Sometimes what I'll do is I'll do something like this. Like this quad hasn't seen much airtime since it got cold. And this is uh, my platform for motor testing. And these are the, the Speedix 1205, I forget, 1206 motors as they are here. And so I'll take something like this out to test. I'm not necessarily burning to do a review on it. I'm curious. I want to find out how these motors perform, how they handle these props. Maybe I want to swap out different props. Doing motor test reviews take me quite a while because I do want to try different things so that when I do a motor review, I can actually bring you some useful information other than, yeah, this performs fairly well. And here's some flight footage where you really can't tell how much better it performs than something else. Uh, that doesn't hold value, I think, uh, for people who would watch that. But what I do is when I'm charging batteries, say I've got a new review I'm working on. I'm charging batteries, and I think I'm going to have a pretty good lump of time to fly the next day. Usually I'm charging at night. I'll charge a couple of batteries specifically for one other quad that I've got sitting on the shelf that I want to take out and fly. And generally speaking, it's one of these two. So um, if I'm doing 3S charging, I'll, I'll just take this out with me. So if I, you know, I stink at flying whatever I'm trying to review, I'll, I'll put a 3S battery on this, generally a 550, and I'll go out and fly this. This is the, the Nita C X, XF3, I think it's called. Um, I did a review video on that. This flies, I like this. This is a fun little uh, quad to fly. This is their V2 edition where you can actually get some reasonable camera tilt out of it. And this is the Skystars X120. Uh, so when I'm going out and I've got a few small 4S batteries, 450s, I can get about a three and a half minute flight or three minute flight out of a 450 4S on this. And this is just outright pure performance fun. I do take these out. And these are the two primary that I take out with me when I'm taking out another quad or two for review purposes. Or if I'm doing motor testing, I'll take out one or both of these quads as well. It's not very often that I'll take out a three inch. What will generally happen on a three inch is if I'm going somewhere for like a weekend trip to visit family or something like that, um, especially some family members that we have that live kind of in the, uh, the, the country, I'll take a three inch quad with me in those cases, but generally I take one of these. I, I know this is a three inch, but th this is kind of a, a lighter, less aggressive three inch than what I'm, I'm talking about, like the Helifire X140 Pro or the XJB um, 145. Those are the three inch ones that I might take with me if we're going out to the country versus these if um, I'm just going out back to do some additional testing. So um, this is a build, this is a buy. You can actually get this in a kit too, but I wouldn't suggest, I mean, Unless you just like building and you have the time for it. Okay, Power Evolution RC. As for a question, have you ever tried surface RC vehicles? And if so, what kind of electric nitro gas? Yes, um, that's actually kind of where I got started in the hobby grade stuff. I had a Tamiya Grasshopper back in 1986, I think it was. Might have been 83. Can't remember for certain. And a new kid moved into the block and he had a Bigfoot. And I loved his Bigfoot so much that I bought a conversion kit for my Grasshopper. The thing did not drive well. Um, later in life, I got, I think it's called a Mini-T, and it's still around here somewhere in the storage. It's like a 
it's like this big and then I bought this brushless motor for it and it runs like a scalded dog but it is so fast that if you're if you're going anywhere over half throttle and you try to turn you're just going to roll the thing it's it's ridiculous but it's so it's so small and to take it rip it up the street was a lot of fun i haven't driven it and driven it in years uh but i have a lot of fond memories and it has seen a lot of abuse but i do have um a lot of experience i spent years doing rc vehicles but really not too many because uh growing up we didn't have much money Rob Wurzer, strangely mesmerizing to listen to you talking while watching your hands. Anyway, my question is on longevity of the passion for the hobby. I wonder where you see yourself in three to five years. Will you still be doing a channel? Does it help uh, you keep a fresh eye on the hobby? Thanks uh, for all. Thanks for all, Nick. Seriously, um, you know it's really hard to say. You know, th this is a hobby, and so life is going to dictate what I'm doing. So if we were to have something that would dramatically change in our life, then it could dramatically change my participation in the hobby. But let's say that things remain the same. Yeah, I would think, I can see at some point where doing reviews might not be a focus of mine, um, just because, I don't know, maybe, maybe in three to five years, I've been doing it about three years, that it might get old at some point. Um, and I think also there's going to be a limit. And that's something I think about quite a bit is how many more different quads will we see? The, the, the changes have been getting smaller and smaller. Look at all the different hoops we've seen over the last four months. The changes are really small. I mean, they're all kind of similar, but we're, we're, we're looking for one little thing that makes it the ideal hoop for us. So... You know, we've only got four motors and four props and one camera. You know, how many different ways can we do this and how many different products will be coming out? Because I can see definitely at some point in time there is going to be interest will wane looking at product reviews like this channel is primarily product reviews. So that that's really hard to dictate. It's going to be, you know, maybe the hobby changes direction somewhere to where we see something new and innovative that respawns a whole new product category within what we're doing. I don't know, but I do like to fly. I fly, you know, unless I'm on a boat in the middle of the ocean, I do fly pretty much every day, at least one battery. Um, I think I average somewhere between 50 to 70 flights a week. Um, so I like to fly a lot. I don't fly because I want to get faster or better. I fly because I like it. It, it takes me out of any stresses or worries I might have. Um, and even when I fly bad, it's kind of like, um, you know, those bumper stickers where people say, you know, a bad day fishing is better than a good day at work. It's kind of like that, you know, a bad day of flying is better than a, a day without any flying. So I would, I would rather fly. So I think even if I'm not actively running this channel, I think I'll probably still be flying and I'll probably still be flying, flying quads and it'll be micros because, you know, my kids are, you know, I've still got, I've got an eight year old. So she's not going to be out of the house for at least another 10 years. Maybe in five or six years, they're all old enough out doing their own things and fully formed humans. And um, I have extra time where I might fly a five inch, but I'm kind of a lazy guy. I'd rather just go fly in the backyard. I, nothing about flying a five inch motivates me to travel away from home, um, my comfort spot in life. So I'll probably, yes, in three to five years, I'll probably at the very least still be flying and I'll still be flying micros. Tadasu? Was there a beginner mistake that you wish you hadn't made? What soldering iron do you use? Recommend. Love your reviews. Merry Christmas. Happy New Year. Thank you very much. Um, a beginner mistake that I wish I hadn't made. I, I can't think of a moment, but I think the thing that caught me off guard was how much time, not running a channel is going to take, but how much time I was going to be spending just figuring stuff out. And sometimes that can be a frustrating process of figuring stuff out. I oftentimes tell the story, you might, uh, two and a half, three years ago, whatever it was, we had these little brush boards, um, Saisky boards from oh, Overdrive RC or something like that. They were like the first micro brushed quads, not the first, but you know, early on that was readily available and you could buy it for 30 some dollars. And it took me more than six hours to just bind my radio to that board. It was such a learning process and I think that's the one thing that if I were to try to impress this on to anyone new to the hobby is this stuff is far easier than it used to be but it's still not easy 
you are going to have to give it some time. You are going to have to do some research. You are going to need to be a little bit of a student. Uh, because if you just pose your question to someone else, you're now waiting on them to return. And that asynchronous communication of posting, you may not get a return very quickly. So your excitement to fly may be weeks away yet because of that. Unless you've got a buddy or somebody who's around. Uh, and in that case, that's a great benefit. But um, that's the one thing that I think surprises me about this hobby is how much time I spend figuring stuff out. Um, and I don't have to figure out nearly as much. Sometimes the what I'm figuring out is uh, an answer to a question. Because sometimes when I get questions, there's not enough details to give um a, a real concise answer i have to kind of make some assumptions and some guesses and ask some questions within my response um to try to get down the road to where i help them effectively but that that's the one thing i think that has caught me off guard knucklehead rc thanks for all the great content nick question with all the amazing advancements in our hobby over the last few years what do you think hope 2019 will have in store well, I, the one thing that we talk about quite a bit is always improving the video because it's such a big part of the flight experience. And batteries is the others. You know, motor performance is going to just continue to get better and better. Prop performance is going to get continue to get better and better. Our components will get better and better. And those are going to be small changes along the way. Little tiny changes to all these things. But video is such a big part of the experience that I think a lot of people keep thinking about HD video live in the goggles. And Connex tried that. And maybe there's some companies out there trying it. I don't think we're going to see that, especially not in micros. Um, I just I just don't think the technology is there in the fact that we can buy it at a price point that we're willing to crash it, kill it, and have to replace it. And that's all part of figuring out the market from a business standpoint is we won't see those things unless they can make money uh, because businesses are in the business of making money. Um, they do that through products or services. I do think what we're going to see is improvements in these HD FPV cameras. And I, I think that's a good thing for micros because then you can have... I think the boards are going to get smaller. I think they're going to start shrinking down even more. I think um, hopefully... Hopefully somebody figures out how to bring kind of that super view to video without having to do a bunch of post-processing. I think the cameras are going to get better, but I think the one improvement we're going to see that's going to be fairly quickly is the FPV view of these cameras is going to improve. Um, I think that's really important because right now it's kind of muddy in my opinion. You can get some pretty nice HD video out of the camera from your SD card recording, but the live view just isn't very good. And that, for me, kind of tempers the experience a little bit there. So that that's what I think. I think most of the other changes that we'll see in the in the coming years are going to be small changes. I don't think we'll see a big boom, but we could. It would sure be exciting if we saw a big booming change in our hobby. And the last question from Ben Woodward, why the X-Lite instead of the X9D or QX7? Uh, one reason, the X-Lite fits my hands way better. Uh, the X9Ds and the QX7 are both very large, very bulky uh, radios. I, I had the QX7 for a while. I could not fly with that. I'm a pincher. I could not fly with the QX7 at all. I think if you wear a neck strap and it hangs from your neck strap, and I don't like that. I don't like things hanging from my neck. I don't wear a necklace. Um, I wear a tie when I have to, but I, do, I don't want it hanging from my neck. I want to just hold it in my hands, and I want to pinch, and I want to fly, and I want to be comfortable. The X9D is much more comfortable to fly with, and I actually was using the X9D. I think I have a Pro or a Plus sitting back over here that's I, I used for six, eight months, whatever, before the X-Lite came out. But the X-Lite just fits my hand so much better. It's so much smaller. It, it's easier for me to, for, to grab two or three quads. And, you know, a pocket's full of batteries, my goggles and the X-Lite, uh, our camera for recording, and I march off to go fly. But if I have to grab that X9D, then I usually have to make a secondary trip. So purely from a size standpoint, and it's cheaper. The X9D I bought, I think, was 250 bucks. The X-Lite, I think, is like 119 or something like that, right? Um, I actually bought stick ends for the X-Lite that were longer, tried them out, took them off. I really don't need any of the extras that you can buy for the X-Lite. I thought I did, but I don't. I, I, I don't fly as well with longer sticks, and I thought I needed longer sticks to make the X-Lite fit me. I just don't. I do. I, um, I adapted. You know, we're, we're, as humans, we're amazing. If we give ourselves time and we have the patience to kind of bear through some of the rougher moments, we will adapt. Um, and But to answer your question, size. 
Okay, that was the last question. This video is probably extraordinarily long. I apologize. Hopefully you've clicked your um, the section that you wanted to see down below. I, I enjoyed this. I didn't pick out every question. I think I had somewhere in the nature of 20 questions that I tried to answer. Uh, we had that little bit of a drama there, business in the, in the beginning. Again, I'm not asking for anyone to take up that charge. I just thought there needed to be some clarity added to that creator's video that I didn't necessarily appreciate them calling me out on. I thought it was a little bit of a... Uh, um, I don't know. It's not something I would have done. And therefore, I didn't appreciate it. But I appreciate your time, and thanks for watching.